I'd like to call to order the Tuesday, April 18th, 2017, Sheboygan County Board of Supervisors meeting to order. Certification and compliance with the open meeting law. The agenda was posted on April 13th at 2 p.m. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Roll call. There are 21 supervisors present. Thank you. Before we consider the memorial resolution to uh, former supervisor Jack Van Dixhorn, Adam. Would you step forward, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening. I'd like to start by introducing a very important family tonight. If Audrey Van Dixhorn could please stand, and her daughters Jody, Kimberly, and son-in-law Jeff. We welcome them, and tonight we're going to share a tribute about Jack, and uh, shortly they'll be up here. Thank you for joining us tonight. Jack has served on the county board for 20 years. He started in 1998, and there wasn't a committee for the most part that he didn't participate on. As you know, he was on the Health and Human Services Committee, the Transportation Committee, the Planning and Resources, Agriculture and Extension Committee, the Finance Committee, the Law Committee, the Agriculture and Land Conservation Committee, the Property Committee, and the Land Conservation Committee, some of which have been combined over the years and, and that he supported consolidations. Jack was a good, thoughtful county board supervisor, and I am so blessed, and I know that all of us in this room feel the same. We were so blessed to get to know him and to work with him. I've heard many of you say there are a few board members that had a bigger heart Tom Agerbrecht said to me the other day, he was the heart of the Health and Human Services Committee. He always looked for the good in others. He always treated others as he wanted to be treated. And I know he took a tremendous amount of pride working with you, working for Sheboygan County. Jack was instrumental in supporting some significant initiatives that this board has all been a part of, the transportation complex, having served as chair of the Transportation Committee, he was proud to see that land purchased and for the county to break ground. He was proud of the initiative for the half percent sales tax to bring more dollars, reliable dollars, to maintain our transportation <coughs> system and share that revenue. He was proud of the Amsterdam Dunes Wetland <coughs> Mitigation Bank and Preservation Area. He was proud of the work by the Health and Human Services staff on drug and proud of consolidating UW Extension with UW Sheboygan, which may have been one of the more controversial matters that he took a strong leadership role in. And I think time has shown that was a real visionary move on his part, and ultimately with the full support of the board. And of course, he was proud of our fiscal track record. We know Jack as a county board supervisor. But not many of us got to know him as a husband and a father and a member of the community that was really engaged. So we've put together a few slides. My assistant Elaine's up here, as you can see. We put a few slides together with the help of Audrey. And I'd like to share a little snapshot about our friend Jack Van Dixor. Jack graduated from Sheboygan Falls High School in 1954. And I think as some of you shared with some of you I've shared this with before. He was a few years older than my dad. My dad went to school with him. My dad remembers him. And 
my dad talks fondly about him even to this day as being this incredibly powerful athlete, good at basketball, football, track, and I would hear these stories through my dad's eyes. Next slide, please. Jack is there on the first row, number 30. He was a fullback on the Sheboygan Falls High School football team that won their second conference championship in 1953. And Jack was a big reason or a big part of that team's success. Next slide. As I visited with Audrey last week, she was kind enough to share with me Jack's memorabilia from when he graduated. And I went through many of the articles and I thought I'd share just a few with you this evening. And I know we have some athletes in this room. I know Roger Destruti was a significant football player in his day and I know many of you uh, participated in sports or athletics and you may appreciate just a few of these comments by the press. In September 1953, the Panthers met Falls Falcons and lost. And another reason that puts Falls on top in pregame odds is Jack Van Dixhorn, a powerful fullback who has been responsible for most of the Falcons' running game success. Stop Van Dixhorn and you'll stop Falls in the cry of the Panthers' practice. In September of 1952, no particular order, Falls, uh, victory over Keel, 40 to six. Burley, Jack Van Dixhorn, cracked into the end zone for three touchdowns and capping his prep career with some smashing play. Gained 149 yards on 14 carries. There's a photo, yeah, that's the one right up there. The Falls Falcons flashy fullback. How many of you refer to Jack as a flashy fullback? <laughs> oh, we've known him. The Falls Falcons flashy fullback, Jack Van Dixhorn, did just about everything imaginable against New Holstein last night as he led his teammates to a 26-6 EW victory by racking up 165 yards and scoring four touchdowns. Falcons take championship. Jack Van Dixhorn powered the Falls attacks on the ground, pulling up 149 yards in 14 attempts and banging over three touchdowns for his best game of the season. Not only was he an outstanding football player, my dad predominantly remembers him as a basketball player, and he'd refer to Jack as just being this powerful young man on the court and a tremendous rebounder. Apparently he was starting already as a junior, which was unusual. I think predominantly you see seniors starting. And at that time he was 6'1", 220 pounds. He was a powerful man. And he was made captain. Jack Van Dixhorn, veteran center on the Falls High School basketball team, which tied for third place in the Eastern Wisconsin High School Conference this year, was voted <coughs> captain by his teammates. In a game with Oostburg, Jack Van Dixhorn was the big gun against Oostburg dropping in 29 points, and against Fort, he made 18 on six baskets and six free throws. He also participated in track. We don't have any photos of him, but he, he threw the shot put and the discus. I imagine that power contributed to his success there as well. Van Dixhorn takes double win. Jack Van Dixhorn, senior weight man from Sheboygan Falls, tossed the shot put 49 feet, two inches, for a new meet record. The old mark of 49 inches, one and a, 49 feet, one and a half, was set in Kohler. I'm sure he really appreciated getting that. Van Dixhorn wins first in state in discus event. Only one Falls High School track man took honors at the state Class B track tournament at the University of Wisconsin last Saturday afternoon. He was Jack Van Dixhorn, who has been commanding the top spot in the shot put event in virtually every meet in which he was entered this season. Jack hurled the metal shot for a distance of 49 feet, 10 and a half inches to take first place in the state meet 
in the sectional tournament in Port Washington on May 21st, 1954. Jack threw the shot even 50 feet to gain first place there. It was just such a treat. It was just such a treat to read through these articles. And I wish, I wish I had sat down with him just once and uh, talked to him about those days. Just once. Never did that. But it sure was touching to go back and read those articles. Tom wrote a nice note in the newsletter that went out from the Health and Human Services about Jack. And he concludes by stating, when I think about Jack now and the years of service he gave so willingly to our cause as well as to others, I don't know what he could have taught us any more, I don't know if he could have taught us a more important lesson. Assuring that people are better off as a result of our efforts is about as simple and as good as it gets. We'll miss you. After a very successful high school, he went on to serve in the United States Army. And they knew he was a football player, and he played football at that time as well. Next slide, please. He married a remarkable woman in 1962. I introduced Audrey a moment ago. A number of you have met her before. And they have been married for a number of years, as you're going to see in a moment. But what a remarkable family started uh, with Jody and Kimberly that are here today, and you can see those two cutie pies sitting on their parents' lap. Next slide. And the family grew, and Kimberly and Jeff, who's with us today, were united in marriage, and I know Jeff shared with me on a couple of occasions just how he became a son to Jack and how close they were. Next slide. Jack was very involved with Kohler Company and traveling the country and regularly went to China as a quality product engineer for Kohler Company. I did hear him talk about that from time to time. And I imagine uh, the experience was uh, pretty remarkable. I've never done anything like that. But he routinely traveled. And in fact, as he got older, his wife Audrey told me that one of the reasons he was looking to retire was to slow down all those travel commitments. But what an experience. Next slide, please. You may not recognize that person next to Jack, but that is David Kohler him with a pin after 37 years at the Kohler Company. Next slide, please. Jack had a big heart. He liked to have fun. He was an avid Wisconsin sports fan. Had tickets, season tickets to the Brewers games, to the Packer games. I know something special that him and Jody shared were going to Brewers games. And Kimberly and Jack would go to Packer games, and they just made a lot of memories. And uh, Jack, as you know, he wasn't afraid to have a little fun. Next slide. His wife, Audrey, and him married 55 years. Many of us um, can only hope to have that kind of long relationship and quality relationship. And as I chatted with Audrey at the house the other day, you know, it's when you, whenever you walk into somebody's home, you immediately get a snapshot. And, and the photos of the family on the wall and all the experiences. And the first thing Audrey said was, this is Jack's chair. that chair was a copy of the Bible and a copy of county board materials. And I thought, what a good man. What a good man. She uh, showed me a number of things around the house that were very special. Next slide, please. Audrey, I didn't know this about her, but she was a nurse at uh, Aurora for 43 and a half years. Audrey, am I getting that right? 43 and a half years. I'm married to a nurse. Uh, I know Roger Destrudy's married to a nurse. I have just such respect for that profession. And 43 and a half years she gave to this community. And as we all know, behind every good man, there's an equally, if not better, spouse. And uh, I just know they had a remarkable life together. So with that, I will turn it over to the chairman, and then uh, the family can come forward in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much for that, Adam. Thank you, Elaine, too. Okay, we'll consider the memorial resolution, resolution number one. 
honoring the life of County Board Supervisor Jacob Jack Van Dixhorn. Whereas County Board Supervisor Jacob Jack Van Dixhorn passed away on March 17, 2017, and whereas in addition to service on the County Board, Mr. Van Dixhorn was involved in a var variety of community activities, including being a member of the Sheboygan Police and Fire Commission Board, a member of the State Board of Directors for the Wisconsin Land and Water Conservation Association, former president of RCD Glacierland, as, and as an active member of Bethlehem Lutheran Church where he served as an elder, treasurer, and trustee. And whereas Mr. Van Dixhorn was a county board supervisor for 19 years from 1998 to 2017, serving on the Land Conservation Committee from 1998 to 2002, the Property Committee from 1998 to 2008, the Agricultural and Land Conservation Committee from 1998 to 2008, the Law Committee from 2006 to 2008, the Finance Committee from 2008 to 2010, the Planning Resources, Agriculture and Extension Committee from 2008 to 2012, and on the Health and Human Services Committee and the Transportation Committee at the time of passing. And whereas Mr. Van Dixhorn provided essential leadership and support for a variety of county initiatives, including but not limited to co-locating the UW Extension at UW Sheboygan campus, the acquisition and development of the Amsterdam Dunes Wetland Mitigation Bank and Preservation Area, and most recently in his role as Chairman of the Transportation Committee, the construction of a new transportation complex. And whereas Mr. Van Dixhorn will be remembered for his thoughtfulness, kindness, good humor, and the pride he took in county government, now therefore be it resolved that by passage of this resolution, the county board herewith makes public its recognition of Mr. Van Dixhorn's dedicated service to the citizens of the county and expresses its heartfelt sympathy to his family and friends, and especially his wife Audrey and his children Jody and Kimberly respectfully submitted this 18th day of April, 2017. Thank you. Pursuant to County Board Rule 213, this resolution will be on the floor for immediate action. Please join me in a rising vote and a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Audrey, if you and family members would like to come forward now. As I drove away from their home, please come forward. I noticed in my rear view mirror the flagpole that was prominently displayed in their front yard. And on that flagpole was the United States flag, the Wisconsin flag, and the Sheboygan County flag. And for those of you who aren't aware of it, when the county adopted our official logo, Jack took the lead to have a county flag prepared that had our county logo on it. And I think that once again just shows the pride that we took in this organization. Audrey, there's another flag. And if you need any more, you just let us know. Thank you. Audrey, on behalf of the Sheboygan County Board of Supervisors and the Sheboygan County as a whole, we want to thank you for sharing Jack with us. We're going to miss him. Big shoes to fill. Thank you. Thank you very much for the tribute to Jack. I know he'd appreciate it. And he thoroughly enjoyed working on the county board. He could never wait to get to the meetings. And I know he put a lot of time and energy into it. Thank you all so much. Approval of the March 21st, 2017 journal. Supervisor Winkle. Motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Winkle. 
Supervisor Glavin. Second that motion, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Glavin. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Nay. That motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. Presentation. We have Greg Schnell, our Transportation Director, update on the Transportation Complex. since I've been here. In fact, it was Christmas, so I was beginning to wonder if maybe there was a mistake made that night and you guys didn't want me to come back. So. <laughs> <laughs> the first slide that we have up on the, uh, uh, on the screen is just a little bit of history, which I thought was kind of unique. This was built in the 1930s. That's what we moved out of, and then we moved into the facilities over on 23rd Street. The interesting part to this is, is that uh, Cautious Construction was the former owner. They bought that from the county, and that's now the county, or that's now the company that's going to be building our new facility. So I thought it was kind of unique that we uh, use that as our opening slide. Next slide, please. This is the overall view of, of what the land that we purchased on County Trump J in '67, as it as it looked in 2014 prior to construction. Next slide. This is the over the over the aerial view from March 31st. So there's a considerable amount of uh, As you can see, there's a considerable amount of fill that's been hauled in at this point. Uh, there's a retention pond that's been placed back here where we're going to take all of the uh, water that's coming from the west and not drain it across our facility and into that pond, uh, which is all okayed by the DNR. Next slide, please. This is as of uh, April this last week, uh, April 17th. Um, as of this photo, there's been 10,000 loads of material. I think the last time that Adam had spoke to you was uh, 7,000. So there's a considerable amount of work that's been happening. A lot of the additional fill has uh, a lot to do with the types of conditions that we've been working in. We've worked throughout the winter, <coughs> starting in November, so obviously they're, we're working in, in conditions that normally aren't set up for construction. However, we're in a very good position today in order to continue moving the uh, project forward. You may wonder where all that material came from. This is our, our pit on County Trunk uh, J, which we call a line pit. This area here is Road America just so you have an idea of where we're at. We also have a pit on this side of the road. Um, that's the aerial view uh, as of 2014. Next slide, please. As you can see, we put a tremendous hole in here to make sure that we're, we're building our site and putting the materials that's needed to support the facility that we're putting in there. We're very fortunate to have these resources within a half a mile of the, of the site. So it's, uh, it's been a, a tremendous resource for us to provide the material as well as take the material back that we, we can't use on the site, the waste material. We can use that for our, our reclamation when these pits are no longer in use. Next slide, please. I wanted to give you an idea of where our, our utilities are going to be coming from. <coughs> this area right here is Rocky Knoll. The water tower is on this side of the of their uh, facility. There's a road that comes down through the back here, it's the blue line, and it'll follow the Rocky Knoll Way, the south entrance into Rocky Knoll. Our water will be coming from that water tower down this road along 67, shoot diagonally into a hydrant right about here. Our sewage will come out of our facility, come out on this line right here, and tie into the force main that feeds into the city of Plymouth. So we are not going to have a holding tank or wells on our facility. It's gonna, there's going to be a hydrant and we'll be utilizing uh, Rocky Knoll's water. Their capacity of the water that they have in their water tower is bigger than the water tower that feeds the village of Wall. So uh, water is not going to be an issue for them nor us. Along with that water, there's also there has some upgrades that Rocky Knoll needed to make to that water tower <coughs> that we'll be participating in. And so it's kind of a group effort and I think that the timing is, is, is just right for that. I wanted to talk a little bit about the phasing of the project. This is an overhead view of what, what, what's, what's going to be happening. The green, the blue, as well as the purple here are all in phase one. Phase one being the consolidation of Plymouth and Elkhart Lake. This is the part that we need to have constructed, and these salt sheds here, 
um, by the end of this year. Our move-in data, our targeted time to have this facility up and running for those guys to utilize this for this um, fall or this winter will be November 1st. Uh, and at this point, we're set up to, to meet that deadline. We did make some changes that has caused a couple of delays with our of the items that we're uh, waiting for from our, our consultant. Um, I, I can get into that. Next slide, please. This is another overhead view just so you have an idea of what has to happen first. This is what's going to house all the plows that are going to be taking care of the, of the winter or the roads in that area um, uh, over the winter months. So this outline of this, actually the whole outline of this facility will be done, although the, the finished features of this part as well as the shop will not be completed. They will start in 18, um, and uh, we'll, we'll, that's when the rest of the facility will, will all be moving out in 2018, hopefully by mid-18. But this has to be completed in order to, uh, for us to, to support the areas that need our services over the winter months. Next slide, please. This is just an overhead view of, of what's currently, it, it is what it's going to look like. However, the changes that I alluded to earlier, is these salt sheds are now moved over to this area right here. We turned them, they'll face the south, and we've also closed the gaps. So we put them together uh, with a, a wall separating the two because one will be the state's salt shed and the other will be the county salt shed. By making this move and sliding the building a little bit to give us a little bit more room along the western part here has caused a little bit of, the, of those delays. We also took this little bump out here, which houses our, uh, our patching material uh, for winter use catching roads over the winter months, um, that will be slid around to the back. And then obviously that will provide a lot more free flow in this area and just give us a little bit more space. We've also slid this cold storage or unheated uh, facility back <coughs> to this line and then reduced that uh, back there as well to give us a little bit more room in between the buildings. Just, just another view, side view of, of how it's going to look in front of this. Uh, this is what you're going to see from State Highway 67, and this is County Trunk J. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, 10,000 loads of material have been hauled into this site. As you can see, there's a, um, obviously the truck, or the, the sign says it all, truck leaving and then going. Uh, the site itself, when the trucks come in with the good material to haul in, they back over to this backhoe or this backhoe and they take material out. So it's a continuous flow, back hauling all the time so that we can save the dollars and be more efficient uh, on that end. Thank you to all the resources that you guys have provided us over the years. We were able to do this with all of our, our men and our equipment. Um, I, th I think it's a great attribute to have all these, the, the ability to do this and, and do it in-house makes a lot of sense for us. Build our own roads, build this site. Um, there's a lot of benefits to that. So thank you very much for that work, that, that equipment and that. This is what we call a bad day in our business. This is when you're trying to do too much and, and maybe not the right conditions. And you can see a bulldozer right here. Well, that can't move off of that spot. This material is very wet and slippery and, and grimy. He couldn't move, so we had to bring in a little help from a friend and maybe push him off of there. So <laughs> it does happen in our business as well. You've seen this slide last month as well, but I, it, was, it was a reminder for me to share with you that uh, we do have interest in our, in our facilities. Um, we did not receive an offer to purchase on this facility. However, we had some interest. We had some people come through and they've uh, followed up with um, some more information as far as what the utilities are and, and what they could be looking forward if they, if they would happen to purchase it. Next slide, please. This is our Plymouth facility, as you've seen from the last, uh, last month. We do have an offer to purchase on this facility. Um, we are working with Corporation Council, Adam, myself, and Bernie um, are reviewing those documents. And um, we've also had uh, three others go through the facility as well. So there is interest in, in, in these buildings. Just to back up a little bit on the, uh, I don't know if Adam went into this last month, but the appraised value of the, of the facility on 23rd Street is $1.4 million. And the appraised value for the Plymouth facility is $605. These are fresh appraisals. We had these done just in, in March now so that we are current and up to date because obviously that market does have the ability to change. So we wanted to make sure that we we're changing with them. This is what it's going to look like in 2018. I think that we've gained a lot of efficiencies by going from um, 
the six that we have now to four and puts us in all four corners of the, of the county to give us that, that serviceability that we need in order to move forward for the next 80 plus years. That's the last of my presentation for the uh, complex. Um, on your desk tonight, I just provide you a map of uh, the work that we're looking to do in 2017. You can see it's color coded, and uh, below there's a legend for uh, what those color codes mean. On the back side of that is, is the road. Uh, I want to draw to your attention that we made a promise at the beginning part of the proposal for the, the uh, half cent sales tax that we were going to pave 30 miles of, of road. The paving that's included in this in this map is 30 miles, 30.94 miles. By the time we're done patching this year, we'll we'll uh, do better than, than 30 miles of paving. And that's what we promised to do. There's also some reconstruction, there's a bridge replacement. So there's gonna be a lot of activity that's gonna be happening this summer and uh, we are looking forward to the challenge. As we progress and what we're working on now is we start to look at 2018. And we've already prepared for 2018. We have three bridges that are currently under, under design, one to be built in 2018, one in 19 and one in 20. Associated with that, we also have construction that's in currently in design. We have to start planning three to four years in advance of these projects because of utilities and right away purchases and those types of things. So the three of the roads that are in design are 20 trunk PP from Highland to Taylor, um, 20 trunk D from 57 all the way to Cedar Grove, which is a six mile stretch, so it has to be a phased approach. We can't build it all in one year. And we also have 20 trunk A, uh, west of Glen Beulah uh, to Highway 23. So those are all in the works and all in the hopper that we can continue with our construction so we're looking forward to the next project and the next project so that we can stay ahead of, of how these funds are going to be spent and, and, and so we can deliver the package that the people want us to do with the absent sales tax. That is all I have tonight. I wanted to keep it short. I know I went over a little bit, five minutes, six minutes maybe. But, um, yep. Supervisor Abler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Greg, what's going to happen with the, uh, the intersection of 67 and J? Will it remain the same? Will there be? It will remain the same at this point. Uh, okay. We've, we've had some conversations with the DOT. Um, it was one of the points that was brought up in our uh, public information meeting when we met with a lot of the neighbors. We invited, uh, we went out a quarter mile from, from the site, and that was a, a point of interest. Um, some of the issues that are occurring at the intersection don't have much to do with the intersection as they do with driver habits, if you will. Um, the, uh, at this point, not all of our trucks leave at the same time, not all of our employees come in at the same time, so we don't think that we're going to be a hindrance, besides the fact that we've had pits just to the west of there for a lot of years already. So we've been a, a part of that intersection. So right at this point, to answer your question, there's nothing uh, prepared to, to, to happen at <coughs> the intersection in the future. Thank you. And that'll be a DOT uh, decision when it, when it comes up. Supervisor Uraner. Thank you, Chairman Wagner. Mr. Schnell, I'm always interested in the financial picture. Do you have any insight as far as what the cost is for 2017 um, to, to do the, those 40, 30 miles of road? The paving, I believe, we're at like $3.6 million. Um, and don't quote me on the numbers, but I don't have any of that stuff in front of me, so I apologize. Okay, just a, just a ballpark. Is, you know, we spent $4 million approximately in 16. Do we expect to spend $8 million in 17 or? $8 million. I guess the, your question is, is kind of loaded. I, it, as far as spend it on just the paving, on construction, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of elements that go into what we spend in our budget. So there is no intention to load my question. I want to clarify that. I, you know, really, I'm just honestly trying to understand, I understand what our estimated cost is since we have a plan out there of what we're, what we're thinking we should be spending. Right. And I realize you've got fixed costs and other pieces, but I'm thinking, you know, you've got this plan, I'm hoping we've got some dollars so we know we're getting all the sales tax money in, is it gonna be spent, are we gonna have extra funding? That's, that's really what I'm looking at. Our so intention is to spend the money that's associated with our budget. That's what was approved by, by your board. Okay, and that will cover then the 30 That's miles. correct. So, okay, and then since your budget is kind of just all grouped together and not, we don't have an enterprise fund for the specific we, to the roads, what 
specific to the roads might we be spending? We have a, a our, the, the, our budget is separated out to the, the funding that, or the money that will be spent on the roads okay. is segregated, that's sales, okay. sales tax money. Okay. So yeah. that will be spent on the roads. Okay. Does that answer your question? And, and you, we don't know exactly what that is at this point, no general. The estimated dollars I think we had was $6 million that we had to spend. Perfect, uh, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Rainer. Anybody else? Thank you very much, Greg. You're welcome. Public addresses. Uh, we have none. Letters, communications, and announcements. I have two requests from the City of Plymouth to change county supervisory district boundaries to reflect recent annexations. They'll be referred to the Executive Committee. I have a resolution from the Burnett County Board of Supervisors regarding unemployment and seasonal workers. I will receive that for information. I have another resolution from Burnett County regarding increasing elected officer salaries midterm. They'll be received for information. And finally, I have a resolution from Lincoln County Board of Supervisors regarding legislative and congressional redistricting plans. They'll also be received for information. And uh, just a note, you have the leadership forum note on your desks as a reminder. That's all I'm going to have. Thank you, John. Uh, County Administrator report, I believe Adam, no report tonight. Thank you. Um, consideration of committee reports, executive committee resolution number 34. Resolution number 34, regarding authorizing the finance committee and finance director to balance over budget departmental accounts Unanimous committee recommendation to adopt. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Gearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move for adoption of resolution number 34. Thank you, Supervisor Gearing. Supervisor Testrudi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll second the motion. Thank you, Supervisor Testrudi. Supervisor Winkle, did you have a question? No. Supervisor Uraner, did you have a question? Yes. Could we get a high level overview of? what the $3.5 million variance is, is one question. Another question is, I've, I've asked this a few times, what specifically is our wage variance from our revised budget? And the third part of this, since our revised budget was $4 million excess expenditure, if there can be a highlight of, of that piece as well. So those three questions. I think that was all gone over at the last finance committee meeting, if I remember correctly. Wendy, do you want to answer it again tonight? Or if you want to, yeah, go ahead. It was not answered. Chairman uh, Wegner, I was given the wage and uh, benefits, and I asked specifically for the wage variance. I thought I was at the meeting, and you weren't at the meeting. I, I was, and I thought I heard it. but. Supervisor Winkle, go ahead. Point, point of order, it was answered. Yeah, okay, I thought, I, I thought it was. Go ahead, Wendy. Okay. As best you can. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> at the last uh, finance committee meeting, uh, specific to the wages, the um, 2015 actual to 2016 actual uh, comparison showed a $1.3 million increase. This increase is predominantly due to 2016 being the first full year of our combined dispatch. That combined dispatch was representing $750,000 of that 1.3 million increase. Um, if you recall, we brought in from the city 12 dispatchers and four supervisors. For the regular wages, um, for the budget comparison, uh, the budget was um, uh, there was only a change of 82,000. We were within budget by 0.21%. The second question, I think, was on a $3.5 million variance that's part of the resolution. This was also covered in the Finance Committee meetings, um, actually about two or three of them. What we're seeing in that variance to budget is that we had a, we had budgeted for use of fund balance of, uh, for 1.8 for the for the radio, um, subscription radios, that went out, but the project itself came under budget, so we weren't going to be using as much of the fund balance. That's part of what you're seeing in the variance. That would have been in the non-departmental. 
Employee insurances also had a positive variance of 614,000. Rocky Knoll also came in with a positive variance of 818,000. Health and Human Services, positive variance of 674,000. Those were two questions, and I'm not sure I, I know the third committee, if I could get that third question again. Just one moment, I didn't really have my questions written out here, so. And I, I guess I'd like to add, I appreciate there has been a separate handout that I had gotten relating to the total of the uh, report that aren't showing up on the, the, the actual report that we're looking at. Um, so I did ask what, what percentage was the 15 wages over from the 16. I know you gave me one component of that. There's a $1.3 million increase. The percentage came to be 3.49% uh, um, when making the adjustment for the dispatchers, that percentage comes to 1.51. Thank you very much, Wendy. Any other questions? If not, please push your I or nay button. <coughs> Motions approved unanimously. Turn it over to the uh, vice chair. Resolution is introduced. Resolution number two from the Finance Committee. Regarding authorizing the issuance and sale of $10 million worth of general obligation promissory notes. Resolution number two is referred to the Executive Committee. Resolution number three from Health and Human Services. Regarding supporting state funding to local public health agencies for communicable disease control. Resolution number three is referred to the Executive Committee. Resolution number four from the Property Committee. Regarding authorizing sale of Pennsylvania Avenue parcel. Resolution number four is referred to the Finance Committee. Ordinance is introduced, there are none. Next order of business is adjournment. Supervisor Bemis. I move we adjourn. And Supervisor Winkle. Second. The motion second is to adjourn. All those in favor, vote either aye or if opposed, vote nay. Supervisor Winkle seconded the motion and forgot to vote on it. <laughs> <laughs> we are staying adjourned. <laughs>